Fifteen. So we need to go and get. Hey, Tina, is Wednesday at five thirty or is it following the service? It's following the service. Perfect. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Ready? Good morning. Good morning, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. My name is Richard Lawson. I'm the Dean of the Cathedral. I'm joined by Dr. Jasmine Zine, who is our guest Everding lecturer. I'll say more about that in a moment. But first, um, a warm welcome to all of you who are with us here in Dagwell, and a warm welcome to everyone who's joining us via the live stream as well. Before we begin, I will um, offer a prayer before doing a, an introduction of Dr. Zane. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for the beauty of this morning and the mystery of the Easter season. Be with us as we gather here to think about the ways of your love and your deep relationship with all religions and especially with Muslims throughout the world and the youth for whom we pray and think about and seek to protect. We thank you for our guest, Dr. Zine, for her remarkable research, for her mind and heart, which inspire all that she does. Bless our time together. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. It's really good to see all of you. It's good to, to be here. So, um, this, Dr. Zine is the annual Everding Lecturer. So here's what that means. We have a, a wonderful parishioner who happens to be seated in the front row, Lee Everding, and her family for a long time has sponsored this lectureship, which is a joint partnership between St. John's Cathedral and Iluff School of Theology. The Cathedral and Iluff have a wonderful and long relationship that goes back many, many years. Several of our clergy have been trained, for example, at Iliff, including none other than our canon pastor, Katie Pearson. She was trained there and at Swanee. Um, so rich, rich history between these two great institutions. Um, each year, around this time of year, we, we bring in a lecturer, and it usually centers around an interfaith topic of um, sorts. And I'm just delighted that Dr. Zine is with us um, this year. I want, I want to say a little bit about her and then talk about this morning and then what we're going to do on Wednesday evening. I want you to know about that as well. She is a full professor of sociology, religion, and culture at Wilfrid Laurier University. Um, so it's fun to have, you are, I've been here six years, you're our first sociologist to have um, in, this, in this lecture, so I'm excited about that. Her expertise is, is quite broad. Um, I could never summarize it, several areas in which she is um, published. And, but, but really, uh, I think the most important category where she has expertise and the reason why she's invited to be this year's lecture is her real expertise is in Islamophobia. And her most recent book, which we'll be talking about today, is titled Under Siege, and it's about Islamophobia in relation to Muslim youth. So that's what today's talk will be about. I do want you to know about Wednesday evening because we're gonna shift gears quite a bit. On Wednesday evening, at 6 p.m. in St. Martin's Chapel, Dr. Zine and I are going to do a Q&A that I think is going to be quite fun on one of her other areas of expertise, which is um, secularism. And we're going to have a conversation about is the world really secular? There's a lot of academic research, a lot in the press much of which is, is quite simplistic and, and actually naive about what secularism is. And we're going to have a conversation about secularism broadly and then where religious institutions fit into that. Are we declining? What does that mean? What does it mean when experiences of the divine go underground? I think it's going to be a really fascinating conversation on Wednesday evening. So please do come back um, for that. But without further ado, please um, welcome Dr. Zine warmly to St. John's Cathedral and the Dean's Forum. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Lawson, and it's such a pleasure to be here, and I'd like to welcome you with a greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be with you. 
And um, I'm, you know, really happy to see so many people out in the morning coming to a talk like this. It's really lovely. And it's great to be here uh, in Denver and to be spending my time uh, both here and at the Iliff School of Theology. Uh, I'm also really happy that people have come out to, um, you know, share in this topic of learning about Islamophobia, which you know, has become a global scourge in society. So um, I'm going to be talking about the context in Canada, uh, where I'm from. I'm coming here from Toronto, um, which is uh, the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, and I always like to acknowledge the indigenous land upon which um, Turtle Island exists. And so um, that's where I'm coming from. And people often think that, oh, Canada, there, you know, is there any Islamophobia there? Like this is a, a multicultural nation. Your prime minister, you know, meets refugees at the border and hugs them. So how how can there be Islamophobia in Canada? So um, I'm going to be talking about that today. And um, when I said Islamophobia is a global scourge, we can look at various parts of the globe to see, for example, um, you know, the genocide of the Rohingya in Myanmar, uh, the Uyghurs who are in China who are facing, um, you know, internment camps, suppression, ethnic cleansing, genocide. Um, the Hindutva ethno-nationalism in India, which has caused the repression of Muslims there. We can look at Palestine. We can see policies within Western nations that are very much targeted at vilifying and maligning Muslims uh, in many, many nation states, uh, including Canada. So um, it's really important to have this discussion. And while I can't uh, talk about the whole global dynamics of Islamophobia, I will focus on some of my um, research. So I'm going to move around a bit because I've put things on slides. And I also have some notes um, to reflect on as well. So so I'll just be moving around as we um, go through today's presentation. Uh, I'll leave about 15 minutes at the end for Q&A, so um, be looking forward to any questions afterwards. So we can move to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so I wanted to start with actually, as I was thinking about talking about my own research, I was thinking about how innocence has been lost for a lot of Muslim youth. And these were some examples that came to mind. So in the post 9-11 context, uh, Muslim youth have been cast as potential radicals, jihadists, threats to the nation, and many security policies have been targeting them with those um, you know, biased assumptions in mind. And so there's a couple of examples here, and some of you may um, be familiar with um, the first image of um, this young boy who's been dubbed Ahmed the Clock Boy. Many years ago, um, he uh, was building a clock. Uh, he's very into science. And he took it to his school to show his teacher. He was very happy and excited about having done this. And the teacher uh, thought that he built a bomb. So they called the police. And you can see him there in handcuffs um, at his school. And you could see actually the image in the middle of what he actually built and was quite excited to show his teacher. But again, this association between uh, Muslims and terrorism means that even children are affected by this. And we see this in Canada by something called the no-fly kids list. So we have something called the Passion Passenger Protect Program, so a sort of no-fly list that flags people that might be uh, have names that are potential, you know, terrorists or so on. Um, there's been, you know, scores of children, toddlers even, whose names have been on the no-fly list in Canada. So they call them the no kids, uh, the no-fly kids list. And you can see some of the children there that have been flagged at the border. Um, the one boy in the middle is wearing a Montreal Canadiens uh, hockey shirt because uh, one day uh, he was 10 years old traveling with his father from um, Toronto, I think, to Montreal to see his favorite team, hockey team, the Montreal Canadiens, but he got flagged on the no-fly list so he was not allowed to board the plane or see the game. So uh, a lot of the parents that have been involved have done a lot of advocacy and are trying to change the policies in Canada to make sure that people who are falsely flagged, uh, that they rectify this and have really called out the fact that this list has been based on a lot of systemic um, racism and Islamophobia. 
And the third example I have here is a, is a drawing. Now, this was done by a, uh, a toddler. Uh, not a toddler, sorry, in kindergarten. So maybe a child who was around four or five years old in the UK. And he drew a picture and the teacher asked, what, you know, what is that, what's, what's there with the knife? What are you drawing? Because he's like, oh, this is my father. He's like, uh, okay, what is he doing? And the boy said, uh, cooker bum. And they thought that he said, cooker bomb. So they called child services, they called the police, which is part of the prevent policy in the UK. They have a countering violent extremism policy, which does apply to um, nursery schools as well as elementary schools. If teachers think that a student could be radicalized, they have a duty to call the prevent uh, authorities to report them. So this child was reported later when they investigated, they found out that what he was saying was cucumber. He's cutting a cucumber, and they saw, they heard cooker bomb. So from cucumber to cooker bomb, you know, again, that lost in translation, what intervenes in that translation is the Islamophobic context into which even innocent childhood experiences are being shaped. And uh, so I wanted to just open with that. We can go to the next slide. So um, this is just a uh, cover of my book, Under Siege, Islamophobia and the 9-11 Generation. And I'm often asked why I chose to do this research. And there were three primary um, drivers that motivated me to do this study. Um, and I talk about them in the preface of my book. The first driver for me was the experiences of my own sons. I have two sons, and they were part of a generation, part of the sort of millennial generation that I'm looking at, um, that I've dubbed the 9-11 generation, that grew up at a time where their identities were immediately overnight after the 9-11 um, tragedy were transformed as being potential radicals, jihadists, terrorists, threats to the nation. And so my older son, his name is Osama. And so that was not an easy name to have after 9-11. And he was subject to a lot of harassment, you know, because of it. He was getting death threats put in his locker and, you know, his locker would be defaced. People just called him Bin Laden for years. Uh, but he never did change his name, which was, uh, I think, a good thing. Um, although there was a temptation to do that. Uh, I certainly didn't call out his name at Walmart when he was running around right after 9-11. I was not gonna shout Osama <laughs> in that situation. Um, but it was a difficult uh, thing for him to, to have to bear, uh, you know, because of his name, a certain sense of complicity over what happened and had nothing to do with him. Uh, my younger son, Yusuf, uh, was an actor since he was 13, and after a while, he started getting called in for, to audition for roles as terrorist number two. And this became quite commonplace. So my kids are half Pakistani, which is my side, and their father is Moroccan Arab. So, uh, you know, he started being typecast in that way. So that was some of the first impetus for me, was sort of seeing how my sons were being socialized into this environment. And I was also struck and compared it with my own situation as a university student 35 years ago. Uh, I was also um, a student that was part of the Muslim Student Association at my university. I went to the University of Toronto. And we did a lot of events and activities that I realized if we were to do them now, in this heightened climate of Islamophobia, uh, how they would be perceived and what could happen. So for example, I remember that we held a fundraiser um, like a multicultural fundraiser, and we had, you know, um, uh, different people in our community, Muslim communities, very diverse, very multicultural. So we had people come and set up booths where they were selling food and items from Somalia, from Morocco, from, you know, the Middle East, from South Asia. And uh, we needed a large space, so we got a church, uh, no, sorry, it wasn't a church, it was a Catholic school gymnasium. Uh, we rented people were going to come, so we needed to have security. Um, and so we had at the time, now we're talking, this was a period of uh, when the, uh, we were dealing with the Russian invasion of Afghanistan. And so the Mujahideen in Afghanistan were uh, considered, you know, freedom fighters by both Canada and the U.S. And so we had a lot of Mujahideen fighters in, uh, who had been injured because of the landmines and so on in Afghanistan were coming to Canada for rehabilitation. And I happened to live near Afghan House, so I asked some of the brothers there, 
would you come and just with the walkie-talkies and just make sure, you know, traffic, everything is okay. Um, and so there we were in this Catholic gym, this Catholic uh, high school gym, with these, um, you know, men walking around with tunics and turbans and long beards and walkie-talkies. Um, and the fundraiser was for an organization called Human Concern International, which years later was put on a t uh, terrorism watch list, which they were removed from because there were no reason for them to be on that watch list, but they became suspect, as a lot of Muslim charities are currently um, being considered suspect. So put all those ingredients together. You know, you have this group of, large group of Muslims converging on a uh, Catholic school with these guys in tunics and beards and turbans walking around with walkie-talkies. And there is, you know, money being raised for a group that later on was seen as a terrorist organization, wrongly so, but nonetheless. And I thought if that was to happen today, we would have had um, the RCMP, you know, CSIS, which is Canada's spy agency, uh, everybody converging on site. So I realized how times have changed, and we could not reproduce that event in this time. <clears throat> the third impetus for me was actually seeing a student, uh, one of my students, who uh, wanted to join a nonviolent reactionary Islamist group because they were using Islamophobia as a call for followers to adhere to their very narrow world view and um, were calling for the return of a caliphate system for a central religious authority to govern all Muslims. And I was very surprised that this young um, student, he was an undergraduate student and very involved in social justice, would in any way be um, interested in joining uh, a group that I felt had a very you know, problematic and narrow ideological worldview. Not that they promoted violence, but they still had a very narrow worldview. Um, and then I started to see that there was a nexus between Islamophobia and violent forms of Islamism because many of these groups use Islamophobia as a rallying cry and tell the youth, you know, what a lot of them know is the West doesn't want you. They see you as an enemy. So come on our side and come join us and help. We'll build a different society. So um, those were the three kind of things, three drivers for me that made me embark um, on this study. And I wanted to just share that with you as a kind of preface to um, the work that I'm, I'm going to share now. So we'll go to the next slide. So when I talk about the 9-11 generation, I'm talking about a group of youth that came of age during a time where you had the global war on terror happening, you had heightened Islamophobia, and um, you know they were being seen, as I've mentioned, as radicals and jihadists, and that kind of made the Western imperial project seem reasonable and just, and sort of justified as a result. And other studies have looked at how youth have responded to this kind of socialization and what they were experiencing. And uh, in another study, 120 Muslim university students, 94% um, of them agreed or strongly agreed with the statement, I see the ch a change in the way others view me since 9-11. And some research in the United States by Sanaina Myra talked about how American Muslim youth in the post 9 11 context asserted that living with, accommodating, or resisting surveillance are part of the coming of age experiences of the 9 11 generation. And then a study in the UK, uh, in Australia rather, um, found that the youth, Muslim youth there, felt the need to tame their Muslimness strategically to erase and conceal their identities. So these are some of the kinds of moves that youth have to make because of the context that they're being seen in. They will try and downplay their identity or not assert it because they don't want to be met with um, discrimination and with judgment and uh, face bigotry. Uh, next slide, please. So um, in looking at this study, I went back to some of the work of the um, African-American scholar W.E.B. Du Bois. And in The Souls of Black Folk, he asks a question, how does it feel to be a problem? And I felt that this question also was relevant for the work I was doing. So Du Bois says, quote, it is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness the sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. And so that quote and that idea of how being seen 
through the eyes of, uh, through the gaze of others. Um, really resonated with me and the work that I was doing. And so my research draws attention to the ways that the 9-11 generation are grappling with Du Bois's question of how does it feel to be a problem and how they react to being constructed as a problem uh, in Canada. Okay, next slide, please. So just briefly, uh, to tell you a little bit about the work that I did. So um, I am a sociologist. So the work I do is actually uh, ethnographic research. So I go out and I do interviews. So I talk to 130 Muslim youth, uh, including youth workers and some religious um, leaders across Canada. So from New Brunswick to British Columbia. Um, and I uh, interviewed 130 youth. And from their narratives and the stories that they told me, the testimonies that they told me was what I used to craft uh, my book and the analysis um, within it. And so um, these youth came from, what was it, 23 different ethno-racial groups. There was an even split between um, gender. And the field work took place over about um, six uh, years in total. So that's a little bit about the study itself. So I don't do survey research. Um, I'm not looking at you know the questions in a in a sort of um, uh, overview kind of way. I really wanted to get at doing in-depth interviews and learning from these youth exactly what they were experiencing. So this methodology is um, really helpful in getting um, you know to the why, not just the what, but the why of what's going on. Go ahead. And so I looked at a lot, uh, you know, I looked at different things. The book covers a lot of ground, but I was interested in, first of all, looking at, you know, what I call the affective registers of Islamophobia. So when we talk about any kind of discrimination, we can talk about it as a systemic factor, um, you know, and we can talk about policies and processes, and those are all really important. But I also wanted to know how it affected people. Um, you know, how it landed on them and how they reacted and responded to them. And so how it affected their sense of identity, citizenship, belonging, all of these kinds of questions um, and how they lived and navigated with that experience. Uh, I was also interested in the securitization. There's a kind of racial securitization that's been happening north and south of the border where particular groups are being targeted, whether by police, security um, uh, agencies, and so on, whether it's at the borders, whether it's at mosques, whether it's um, you know, in uh, Muslim community organizations, and so on. Um, so I was very interested in Islamophobia and securitization and how that was happening and also how Muslim youth respond to that. Uh, and then finally, I was interested in resistance and how youth are coping with the different um, kinds of issues that they're dealing with, um, the very specific issues that this generation has had to deal with. And I was really interested in how they use the arts as a form of resistance and how they were engaging in different forms of arts, whether, you know, different kinds of storytelling, what we can say is a kind of counter storytelling. Um, to be able to relay their experiences. And I, I think hopefully I have some examples of that for you as well. So those are just some of the broad themes. So we can move to the next slide. So as a starting point, the question becomes, what is Islamophobia? And uh, I want to say that, you know, despite what the title or the name itself seems to denote, Islamophobia is not an irrational fear or hatred of Islam. It's actually rooted in, in racial logics. Um, it refers to demonizing Islam and Muslims. Right? You can have your disagreements with Islam, you can have your disagreements with what Muslims do, that's not necessarily Islamophobia unless it gets to a point of vilification, demonization, and begins to rely on you know, very old kinds of racist tropes that have existed for a very long time. Um, when I say anyone perceived to be Muslim uh, is subject to Islamophobia, if we look back, to after the 9-11 um, tragedy, the first person who was shot in reprisal for those attacks was a Sikh man um, because he was wearing a turban. He was at a gas station and he was shot there. And so anyone perceived to be a Muslim has faced Islamophobia. Often a lot of um, Sikh communities, because they wear turbans, will be misidentified as Muslims. So it affects anyone. I mean, even Barack Obama was accused of being a Muslim and demonized for that and people use that so you know the more most powerful man in the world was also subject to islamophobia um 
So it doesn't mean you can't be critical of Islam as you would any other religion. Um, people also talk about anti-Muslim racism, and that is really how that form of discrimination is enacted on Muslims through policies and practices and so on. But you really can't take Islam out of Islamophobia. But anti-Muslim racism uh, is rooted in the racialization of religion. Right? So when religious categories begin to take on um, racialized elements or we associate them with racialized elements, that is referred to as the racialization of religion. And that's kind of the bridge between Islamophobia and anti-Muslim um, racism. And you know, when we look at Islamophobia, it has a very long genealogy. You know, a lot of people just say, well, don't call it Islamophobia. Let's just say anti-Muslim racism. That's just easier and that's more direct. But if we talk about racism, and there's different kinds of racisms, some are cultural forms of racism, early racism was rooted in biological differences, and, and that's been uh, obviously uh, you know, debunked, but now we see a lot of different cultural forms of racism. And so definitely Islamophobia is one of those forms, but it actually has its own resonance prior to that, because racism was coterminous with modernity and with the colonial project when racial science came in to effect. But Islamophobia goes back to the early um, you know, uh, period when Islam uh, you know, was being revealed to the Prophet Muhammad. He was subject to all sorts of harassment and attacks, and the, his followers were also subject to economic sanctions, to all kinds of harassment. So it has a long history and genealogy. We see it going through to the Crusades, through the um, expulsion of the Moors in Spain, um, you know, so it, it, through the colonial period. So it has a very long history and genealogy. Um, you know, and in my own work, I look at Islamophobia, how Islamophobic hate and bigotry are translated into individual actions that are underwritten by negative ideologies and stereotypes that then find expression in laws and practices. So if we start with, let's say, individual actions, and then you think, OK, well, you know, for example, what's happened in Toronto um, uh, just last week uh, during Ramadan, we just finished the month of Ramadan. Eid was actually two days ago. But last week, we had two attacks against mosques in my community, one where the Quran was desecrated. And um, the person who did that then got in their car and tried to run people over in the parking lot as they were leaving the mosque. Uh, because there's a lot more Muslims in mosques uh, during Ramadan, this became a time where some of these attacks were happening. And <laughs> that person was charged with um, mischief and dangerous driving. Um, and then the next day, another attack happened where someone blocked the entrance to a mosque not far from this one, uh, got out of the car, started banging on people's cars and, and yelling all kinds of things. Um, we've had a mosque caretaker who was stabbed to death a couple of years ago um, by someone who was part of a neo-Nazi satanic cult. Uh, uh, many of you may know that we had a terror attack against a mosque uh, in January 29th, 2017, where six Muslim men in Quebec were killed, shot dead by a white nationalist. Um, so these are some of the individual kinds of actions of sort of hate crimes and vandalism and all of these kinds of things. But then you have to look at the ideological level. Well, what's underwriting this? What is inspiring these things? And that comes from a long history of anti-Muslim tropes and of Islamophobic narratives that kind of give rise to these actions. But then those ideas, OK, let's say the idea, oh, well, Muslims are terrorists. Well, that gets mapped into our security policies, like the so-called Passenger Protect program that is saving you from Muslim toddlers flying on airplanes, right? Um, we have a, a whole host of security policies, as you do here in the US, that very much have targeted uh, Muslim communities differentially uh, and set them out for scrutiny and surveillance and so on. And so that's a little bit of how this dynamic works. And that's sort of my sociological spin on understanding Islamophobia, is to break it down into those individual ideological and systemic manifestations. OK, we can go to the next slide. Sorry, I'm moving kind of quickly because I am covering a lot of ground, but I would lo love to have questions afterwards um, if anything you'd like me to say more about. Um, and I also wanted to point out that Islamophobia is intersectional. There are many different, uh, it's lived differently according to the social identities of Muslims. So 
um, gendered forms of Islamophobia are very distinct to how um, Muslim women, particularly those who wear headscarves <clears throat> or face veils, are um, treated in society and they become subject to a lot more violence. Um, as a result, um, you know, I wore the headscarf hijab for about 17 years. And so I know very much the difference of before and after and um, the ways that people regard your body as a Muslim woman and the, the kinds of meanings and assumptions that get attached to you that have nothing to do with you. Um, but the ideas of being backward, oppressed, um, you know, voiceless, that sort of thing. Um, but there's also anti-Arab racism, anti-black racism, anti-brown racism that all intersect with Islamophobia and therefore Islamophobia gets lived in different ways because Muslims are um, very diverse, two billion people around the world from different walks of life. Um, and so we need to look at the intersectional aspect of Islamophobia and how it's lived differently according to the social identities that Muslims inhabit. So as I mentioned, Islamophobia has had very deadly consequences. And in Canada, we had the uh, 2017 attack at a mosque where six Muslim men were shot dead after their evening prayers. Um, and then during the pandemic in 2021 in London, Ontario, a Pakistani Canadian Muslim family uh, were out for an evening walk and they were intentionally mowed down by a truck, um, killing four generations of that family, four members of the family, um, and leaving a nine-year-old boy fighting for his life. Um, and that was also done at the hands of someone who identifies with white nationalism. Uh, we have about 300 white nationalist groups in Canada of different sizes and stripes. Um, many of them have a very strong anti-Muslim mandate. Uh, in fact, uh, most of them uh, tend to have that. Um, we don't know a lot yet about that assailant, but um, what I do know um, is that in the subcultures of white nationalism, when you kill a Muslim, you become a saint. So the perpetrator of that crime became Saint Nathaniel, and the perpetrator of the crime in the, um, the terror attack in New Zealand, which killed 51 uh, Muslims, also he became sainted. So in those subcultures, um, this is what happens. And so it's, it's a, you know, in some of my other work, uh, more recently I did a, a study in the, uh, that was released in the fall on the Islamophobia industry. Um, and I looked at the networks of Islamophobia that exist, um, which include white nationalist groups along with other kinds of groups that are anti-Muslim, um, you know, far-right media, um, also uh, groups like you know, Hindutva nationalists that are becoming a growing threat. There are um, pro-Israel fringe right groups, um, and there are Muslim dissidents too that are part of these networks. And so we have to battle Islamophobia on a lot of fronts. I call it, you know, it's like when you go to the carnival and you play that game of like whack-a-mole, like you hit it here and then it comes up there. So I, you know, say that Islamophobia fighting it is like playing a game of whack-a-mole because as soon as you hit one target, there's another. So there's lots of moving, you know, targets here. But the bottom line is in Canada, it has reached deadly proportions and uh, of course around the world as well. Okay, next slide. Um, so I was talking about those different dimensions of Islamophobia. I mentioned that there's an individual, ideological, and systemic. So just to break it down a little bit, here's some examples of like individual actions around Islamophobia. Um, uh, there's a list of the different types, but I'll speak to the images. Um, you can see on the one image, an uh, image of a black Muslim woman who was, I think, running for uh, school, school trustee, and her posters were defaced. Uh, we see a swastika on the Edmonton Mosque that was um, uh, put up there a couple of years ago. It was actually the first mosque in Canada. Um, we saw three black Muslim women attacked within the span of a week in Edmonton. Uh, that was just about a year, two years ago. Uh, and then what you see here in the middle is a pig's head. And it's wrapped in cellophane. And it has blue and white bows. And it has a sign on it that says, Bon Appetit. This pig's head wrapped in the, 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 the colors of the fleur-de-lis of, of Quebec, was dropped at the Quebec mosque where the terror attack happened one year before. 
So this was a, sort of a prelude to the violence that was supposed to happen. And as you may know, Muslims don't eat pork. And so, you know, putting a pig's head and putting it at this, um, in the, the door of a mosque sends a very strong message, the sign, bon appetit. Uh, and again, this was the same mosque where the terror attack happened uh, a year later. They later did find it was a white nationalist group that was responsible for um, that action. And you can see it wrapped up in the colors of the, French, um, the um, francophone um, flag in the province of Quebec. So those are some examples of individual actions. We can go to the next slide. <coughs> so there's a lot of ideologies, you know, this is what I was talking about, the underpinnings of Islamophobia. Where do those ideas come from? And the, my work on the Islamophobia industry, I found a lot of um, sort of conspiracy theories and narratives about Muslims that circulate actually globally. Um, I call it Islamophobia's playlist. And, you know, there's sort of the ones that, the sort of uh, tunes that we hear all the time, uh, that Muslims are illiberal, anti-democratic, and incompatible with Canadian values, um, that Muslim women are oppressed. That's part of the old, the, you know, the oldies but goodies of, of those genres of Islamophobia uh, on the playlist. What we're seeing more now are conspiracy theories, and it goes back to that adage, you know, um, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. And that's actually happening through the proliferation of disinformation campaigns uh, on, on the internet and social media and so on, and uh, the widespread conspiracy theories. So uh, the biggest one is this notion of the Islamist boogeyman, which is that Muslims have a, a global conspiracy to take over Western nations by kind of installing ourselves as a Trojan horse that will then, you know, kind of be like the fifth column that comes in, takes over government um, positions, sets up organizations and institutions for the purpose of, um, you know, installing Sharia law, what they call creeping Sharia. Um, and so these Muslim invaders are coming in, but are really jihadists and terrorists, uh, and they use something called taqiyya or deception. Uh, you know, that, for example, Muslims will, will smile and be very friendly, but don't believe them because they actually have a very malicious and nefarious intent that they're hiding. Um, this is part of the narrative that you'll hear. Um, and they will also often um, weaponize the Quran, take verses out of context to use them to say that, oh, look, this is, you know, a violent faith and this is, these are um, pathological, pathologically violent people as a result. Uh, and then there's also the big uh, conspiracy of demographic replacement. Um, some of you may have heard of that theory. It uh, goes back to a um, French um, Islamophobic, um, uh, I don't know, writer, uh, Renaud Camus, who talked about how um, certain, you know, the white race was going to face genocide and other races were going to come and populate Western nations. Uh, at the heart of all of these demographic replacement theories are Muslims, basically. And so they're very widely spread across North America, Europe, and actually uh, even in the situations that we see in China, India, and um, Myanmar. So those are the ideologies. Uh, and again, there's this Islamophobia industry that I mentioned uh, that helps support and, and channel all of these ideas, circulates them within various echo chambers that have now become quite coordinated. Uh, and those are just some of the examples of the groups. I'm not going to get too far into it. Um, but there are, you know, what is really unique about Islamophobia is that there is an industry behind its promotion that works 24-7 that has, um, you know, in the United States, um, there's huge amount of funding for the Islamophobia industry. Uh, about $1.5 billion circulates between 39 organizations um, that are dedicated to promoting anti-Muslim campaigns. Um, there was a study done by uh, the Council of American Islamic Relations in 2019 called Hijacked by Hate that looked at, you know, thousands of pages of um, tax returns and things like that, and we're able to, to do that money trail. Um, that kind of forensic accounting we can't do in Canada. We don't have access to the same funds. But I do know that some of the key players in the Islamophobia industry in the US are also um, connecting with players in Canada. So it's a very transnational network. So I'll just move on to the next slide. 
Um, there's a lot of polls in Canada too that are disturbing in terms of, you know, after you know Trump came to power um, and implemented the Muslim ban as one of his first executive orders, they did a poll in Canada to see well what will Canadians think about this, and they found that one out of four Canadians, about 23%, also favored a ban on Muslim immigration to Canada, and in Quebec that went up to 32%. Um, and you could see some of the other polls where 57% and 51% of Canadians were very worried about their security in Canada because of the Muslim presence. Um, a lot of them felt that 68% um, uh, disagreed with having Muslim women uh, wearing religious articles of clothing, particularly the face veil or niqab during citizenship ceremonies, that they shouldn't be allowed to wear that. Um, that they were symbols of oppression and an anti-woman culture. And a lot of Canadians believe that there is, you know, there is a high level of distrust against Muslims, 52%, and 42% believe that, well, that's really their own fault. So that's just a small sampling of some of the polls in Canada that also tells us about public opinion and that it isn't just in the far-right echo chambers that we see anti-Muslim sentiment, right? It's really in the mainstream. Okay, next slide. Um, you know, I talk a lot about those extreme examples of Islamophobia, but there's also this liberal Islamophobia, which, deal, which has to do with how our policies and practices, um, you know, in Canada, on the one hand, we have multiculturalism, and we have this very celebratory attitude towards minorities, but on the other hand, and Muslims are part of that. Uh, there's a lot of celebrating, we have an Islamic History Month and so on, but at the same time, we have policies and practices that very much um, target the Muslim presence in Canada. Um, and, you know, so that's something that I talk about as a kind of liberal form of Islamophobia. Uh, I think the next slide has some of the policies I'll mention to you, so we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so, you know, in Canada, as I mentioned, while we have celebratory multiculturalism, Islamic History Month, and, you know, our Prime Minister will come in, in during Ramadan and break fast with Muslims, and we have all of those um, sorts of performative aspects of celebrating Muslim presence. As part of Canadian society, we also have things like racial profiling. Uh, we have surveillance, security certificates, the Anti-Terrorism Act. Um, the ban on religious attire in Quebec in the public sphere, which has uh, now become a law. Um, we had the Zero Tolerance for Barbaric Cultural Practices Act and so on, as well as discrimination in all sectors of society. And there's a lot of research now to back that up. So there is that incongruence with the sort of multicultural ethic and then the actual practice um, of um, anti-Muslim racism and discrimination. Okay, next slide. So, um, yeah, I want to share with you now, just in the last few minutes, uh, some quotes from people in my study. This is from a uh, Somali social worker, and he was talking about um, what he has seen in terms of the youth he works with. And he said, since 9-11, the focus has been on the religion and Muslimness, and what it means vis-a-vis -vis press coverage, where the focus is on those who are extremists and use Islamic language to further their agenda. This also becomes linked with regular Muslim youth. So Muslim youth now have to answer the questions of terrorism, extremism, and not fitting in because they are extreme. They don't all belong to these categories, but they have to deal with that now. So if you're a religious youth who attend the mosque regularly and want to have a religiously centered life, the assumption is that you're an extremist. And we know that being religious and being extremist is not the same thing. Everybody, every time somebody blows something up in the world, they are, uh, they are Muslims. It's a reflection on their identity and that stereotype and the assumptions made against them. And that affects them in the workplace and classrooms. So yeah, this quote also speaks to that sense of collective guilt and, bur and, and labeling that Muslims face for the actions of their, you know, anyone who claims to be Muslim and commit any kind of crime anywhere in the world. You know, the next day Muslim youth go to school and have to answer to that. People will question them. People want to know, what do you think of that? Um, and will assume that they somehow condone those actions. Uh, next slide. Um, another uh, youth talked about the Islamophobic labeling, and he says, I guess the single biggest negative impact was that the mainstream majority now probably suspects every other young Muslim male with a basketball jersey or engineering degree to be a potential truck bomber. So we had a long time where, you know, youth were coming as international students, they wanted to take chemistry and engineering, and they were being prevented because the assumption was they were going to use this knowledge to build bombs. 
So he's, as an engineering student, was reflecting on um, that reality. Next slide. Sorry, I'm moving quickly because I'm really mindful of my time. Um, actually, this is a student um, who's Canadian but uh, was living in the U.S. at the time of 9-11, and she said, the day of September 11th, we were watching the Twin Towers falling, and I remember my grade seven world cultures teacher came up and pointed her finger in my face and said, tell your people to stop attacking Americans. I was a very sarcastic child, and I was made fun of because I wore hijab since grade three. So as my defense mechanism, I wouldn't cry. I would just say something sarcastic. So I remember I was really on the defensive because I was emotional, and I was like, hand me a phone, and I'll call my uncle bin Laden. And so a lot of these youth have to contend with that kind of, you know, being very young and people asking you to respond to um, events that have nothing to do with you. So Muslim youth get politicized very early and have to respond to global politics in their day-to-day -day lives because people assume that they have some insight or knowledge about this. Okay. I think I might just, um, can we just move ahead, actually, a couple of slides? Because I know I'm running out of time. Um, Actually, just go, if we go back to the previous one. Just to talk about the gendered forms of Islamophobia, um, this is Sophia, a Somali student, and she says, when you're in public and you're wearing the hijab, you're extremely aware of every action that you take. If you're in a bad mood and you're like scowling at everybody, you're, and you're Muslim, it's not just me having a bad day, I'm the Muslim girl. Um, I don't just represent myself anymore. And so this was something I saw over and over in the interviews that I did with youth, that they felt like they had to be the image corrective. And so, you know, they would be very conscious of how they acted, how they, you know, navigated public space. Um, they were very conscious to, you know, uh, do public acts of charity so people wouldn't think that they were bad people. Um, and so that was something that they lived with because, you know, you could be having a bad day, but if someone sees you and you're wearing a headscarf, it's not just you. You know, it's everybody you represent that becomes labeled in that particular encounter. So being seen as an individual is a luxury that a lot of racialized communities do not have. So I think I'll just go maybe advance towards the end if we can. Um, I think just I wanted to, there's a lot I can't cover. Um, I can come back to some of the surveillance issues, but if we go back to the final slide, I think, yeah, this one here, I'll end here. Um, some of the other slides talk about um, surveillance, and I can speak to that maybe in the Q&A, because some of it has affected my own, my own children. Um, but I, as I mentioned, uh, I wanted to focus in the last chapter of my book. I didn't want to end this book um, you know, thinking that Muslim youth are just victims of circumstance and that they're not actively engaged in resisting the different kinds of marginality and oppression that they experience. So I was interviewing Muslim cultural producers, artists, storytellers, and so on, and looked at their counter stories as creating this kind of arts-based resistance. So here's an example of a Muslim woman who is a spoken word poet. Um, you know, she was interviewed in the book. Uh, on the far end, you see a group called Conflict Relief, and they are an Israeli-Palestinian comedy troupe. Um, one of the founders is Canadian. They actually um, came together in the UK as part of a theater company. And um, they wanted, they go out and do comedy sketches that deal with the, you know, Palestine, Israel. And then they go out in the audience and to kind of debrief and have discussions with people. So they're using comedy as a way to break down people's defenses and to actually engage conversation. So I thought that was a really interesting way of using um, theater and the arts. And the middle one, you can't see very clearly, but it's actually uh, a documentary called I Am Rohingya, A Genocide in Four Acts. And that was a uh, play and documentary that my son did. Um, he met with Rohingya refugee youth in Canada. They wanted to tell their stories. They did it in the form of a four-act play that looked at the experience of their family and the genocide in Burma, being pushed into boats uh, into the sea and landing in Thailand or Bangladesh and then making their way to Canada. And so um, that was another element of storytelling where uh, a lot of these youth want to be able to um, have the mic take the stage and tell their own stories so that it becomes a counter story to the way their lives and identities have been narrated through this climate of Islamophobia. So I think I'll end here so that we have some time for Q&A. Thank you so much. <laughs> So
So I know that um, there's a mic available if anyone would like to answer, ask a question. If you put up your hand, you'll get the mic and then we can have a further conversation. Dr. Zed, could, could I ask a Israeli-Palestinian question? Mm -hmm. and, and this is just from an outsider looking in. Back in the early 90s, this was before Yasser Arafat became very ill. But back in that period, there, there appeared to be a time when the, there was a marked thaw. It, it just, in the news and so forth, at least between the Israelis and the Palestinians. That, that there was a time, maybe six months to maybe two years, where there appeared to be a thaw in relationships. There, there was some dialogue. Um, I remember, at least in the news media, that there were high people in the Israeli military that were having dialogue with um, uh, Palestinian counterparts. Mm -hmm. And there really seemed like there was a, a, a short window where there was really some dynamic action, hope that things would change for the better. C could you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't recall the exact window historically that you're talking about, but, it, you know, I, I think there have been moments where there has been some productive um, dialogue. Um, you know, those issues become short-lived. I mean, we're, we're looking at a situation where this isn't a conflict, you know, you have two very unequal sides here, um, and there's dynamics of power that come into it. So, um, unfortunately, with the current political situation in, in Israel and the kind of very, um, you know, far-right government that's taken over, I don't know if dialogue is going to be, uh, you know, productive. I don't know what the solution is. I don't have an answer for that. I think, unfortunately, we saw quite a lot of violence uh, during Ramadan in Al-Aqsa Mosque, which was uh, people were being beaten, um, tear gassed, you know, when they went to the mosque to pray in the evening. Uh, you saw images of them lying on the, their prayer mats, face down with their hands, and being beaten by batons. So this is not a recipe for any kind of productive dialogue or action. Um, so it's really unfortunate that this continues and that we're seeing, um, you know, so much, um, you know, repression and devastation of uh, people's lives. And so I don't know what the answer, it's one of those perennial issues, but you know, I, I would like to be hopeful at the moment, I can't say that I am, that dialogue will be what, what takes us there. I think the intervention of these youth, um, you know, and this was, you know, they started this many years ago, was to actually have those productive conversations or try to. And they themselves came together as Israelis and Palestinians who were all involved in, in interested in comedy and they all happened to be in the same theater group. And they started having these arguments between them that were very heated. And then they would just kind of start laughing at themselves. And then they said, well, maybe this is something we can use as a kind of, you know, an engagement with other people to at least get a dialogue going in the public sphere about these issues and kind of present, um, you know, uh, an opportunity to have a critical dialogue. So that's what I found interesting about it. It's not a solution to anything, but it's one way that, you know, the arts can, um, foster those critical conversations and those difficult conversations. Yeah, thank you. This is a good follow-up, Dr. Zine. Thank you for your talk today. My name is Deacon Jack Karn here at St. John's Cathedral, and I do work with Israeli-Palestinian American youth uh, with using arts, using dialogue oh. in summer programs in schools. And so I'm just wondering, um, in terms of our work as a Christian community in addressing Islamophobia, can you speak to ways that we can be constructive in addressing this issue? Thank you so much for that question. Um, you know, I think, and I guess on, on Wednesday, I'm going to have more of a conversation of some of that interfaith work. Um, I know I've been involved in a lot of international interfaith um, work. It's mostly been Christian uh, Muslim interfaith. Um, it often hasn't been broader than that. Uh, I think there needs to be broader uh, kind of interfaith work. And so um, I think, you know, having places to have youth engage because, you know, the, uh, for me, you know, especially the work I do is on youth, is that, you know, they are the future, they are the hope for the imagining of an alternative future. 
right? And so I think having them, you know, not carry the biases and prejudices of the past and, you know, move away from the, what they, the, the bigotry they may hear at the dinner table or among their friends or, you know, at gatherings and so on, and to learn to think critically about these issues. And I think from a faith perspective, what's important is that we focus on those elements of our faith that all talk about peace and grace and, you know, um, you know, the Quran says, like, we have been created as nations and tribes so that you may know one another. And so there is that element of the diversity is there. It's not meant to be adversity. You know, it's meant to be a celebration. Uh, we see that diversity in everything that God has created. And it's meant to be synergetic and harmonious. Um, you know, but with humans, that becomes a diff difficult proposition because of all the ways that our differences become hierarchized, become mapped into systems of oppression, become historically constituted. So every encounter that you have, you know, brings that history with it, right? And so um, I think it's great that you're, you know, having those opportunities, and I think the arts can be a wonderful way to convey that. And I think that, you know, having youth do this kind of positive um, cultural production is what resonates with people, you know. It's the kind of message that people would go away and it's, you know, it's like spoken word poetry. I, I use a lot in my classes with teaching, not that I perform it, but I show really wonderful artists because in, th in two, three minutes, they can say what it will take me three hours to lecture. And they will remember that because they experience it at a visceral level, at a spirit level. You know, and we don't engage that enough in education. We don't engage, we engage the mind, we don't engage, you know, the heart or the spirit very much. In fact, students are told to kind of leave that at the door. You know, you don't bring any of that with you into, into classrooms. So wherever we can create spaces where young people can engage again with their heart and their spirit and look at others in the world through that lens, I think that that is really important. We have time for one or two more. Okay, I'll try to ask my question. <laughs> um, one of the things that made me think of um, sitting here in an Episcopal church is, um, are there any religious organizations or institutions in Canada that are instrumental in assisting the Muslim community? Um, for example, in America, you could say that the Episcopal church has been involved with racism and reparations for black Americans. That's a really good question, thank you. Um, it's interesting, most of the interfaith work I've done has not been in Canada. Um, it's been through the World Council of Churches. The last uh, uh, gathering I went to was in Nairobi. Um, I've done stuff with uh, work with Peace for Life and with an organization in New York that takes um, an interfaith group to Pakistan. To, um, and I went as one of the speakers. We went on kind of a speaking tour and they brought people there, I guess, just to introduce them to the culture and people. So I've seen those kinds of interventions. I know that there is interfaith council in Canada, and so, and it, but it's more at the level of religious leaders. So like the imams and the, you know, the pastors and, and priests and, and rabbis and everybody have that interfaith council. I know that there are women's groups. There's uh, Shalom Salam, which is a group of um, Christian, sorry, yeah, no, Muslim and Jewish women. Um, and I was part of a group called the Muslim Christian Feminist Alliance for a World Without Empire which is a long title. We called it just mikvah. And we were scholars, and we were, some were Christian, uh, some of us were Muslim, and we came together, Canadian, U.S., uh, European, to try and have some interventions around this idea of what we call, we talked about as revolutionary spirituality, and how we can leverage spirituality as a way to challenge oppression. And I think that's something that all traditions can do and have the resources within those traditions to do that. Uh, I think all religions talk about challenging oppression, not creating it, but challenging it. But unfortunately, all religions also create oppression, and so that becomes the bind. Um, but, you know, I think there's been some interventions, not necessarily face-based, but, um, for example, when a lot of Muslim women were being targeted, um, they started on some campuses programs where you would be escorted places. If you're a Muslim woman and you were, you know, visually marked as Muslim, um, you could call and people would escort you to places um, so that you weren't alone. So that kind of accompaniment 
Um, you know, uh, they have sort of the solidarity wear a hijab day kind of thing, which I don't know how much I think that's useful because I don't think you can wear a hijab for one day and know what it's like to be a Muslim woman. Um, so I'm, I, you know, I like to see more meaningful kinds of connections, um, but those are the only ones I know about in terms of the interfaith. I think there's a lot of interfaith work that's done, but it's more by religious leaders um, than communities. But they do also have the open doors. I don't know if they do that in the U.S., where all the um, religious, uh, you know, mosques, synagogues, churches, gurdwaras open their doors. People can come in. You know, they have refreshments. You can talk to people, and you know, um, and so they do that at a certain time of the year. So they foster that kind of community building and interfaith knowledge. Yeah, thank you for that. That is our time, unfortunately. As Richard mentioned earlier, Dr. Zine will be back with us on Wednesday. We have the Eucharist at 5.30, and then right here in Dagwell Hall, Richard and Dr. Zine will be together in conversation, so please come back and join us then. We've also invited the Muslim community around Denver to be here with us, so hopefully um, a lot of people will be able to be here for that. As always, please join us at 10.30 in person in the cathedral or online for our choral Eucharist. You can find that at sjcathedral.org. Thank you so much, Dr. Jasmine Jean. Thank you so much.